Hi, I'm Sarah Hart from Drive Heart. We've been talking to loads of our parents about what they want us to do to help them become really good supervising drivers and what are the biggest things and concerns that they've got for their, their young children um, learning to drive. And almost unanimously, the result has come back that they want to know more about the driving test. Because obviously, since the parents did their driving tests, however many years ago, it's changed quite significantly. So what we're going to do today is just talk through um, what the driving test entails, how it's marked and how to best prepare your, your pupil or your student or your daughter or son for that test. At the end of every section, we're going to pop some notes on the screen for you to summarise what we've been talking about. And at any time you can pop a question on and we will aim to respond to your question within 24 hours. So let's first of all talk about how do you know when your child is test ready? So there's a few things that need to have happened. They need to have passed their theory test um, and their theory test lasts for two years. So in terms of the driving, in, in order for a, a, a student to be test ready, they've got to be able to drive completely independently. And that means that they're making the decisions on the road. They're the ones looking at the hazards and assessing them and reacting in an appropriate way they've got to be able to drive as if you're not in the car with them. And that means dealing with different types of roads and the tricky roundabouts. If you live in Salisbury, as I do, um, you've got a quite a complex ring road around the area. So that student has got to be able to navigate any time of the day or night around those junctions. They've got to be able to deal with any types of different traffic situations. They, of course, have also got to be able to deal with all the other road users out there. And that's one of the big things. So it's about making sure that they are progressive with their driving they're not getting too slowly along they're not holding people up and it's about how they react to other road users um the other thing they've got to be able to do um and this is tested during the driving test is they've got to be able to competently follow the sat nav and they've got to be able to follow road signs and markings as well because that is part of the test and that's what they call the independent driving so it's all about keeping keeping that vehicle going making sure you're making good decisions and driving as you would as a parent you know without any help from anyone else so we're going to pop a slide up on there just to summarize um, those points and as you can see there it's a positive and progressive drive that they can drive completely independently and that they're identifying the risks and hazards out there and decision making is good and appropriate. Uh, they've also actually got to be able to carry out the manoeuvres. Now, the test um, comprises four manoeuvres, uh, which we'll come to in the next section. But they've got to be able to get those manoeuvres nailed every time. It's no good one in four, um, but they've got to be able to get them done. Um, and as I say, they've got to know how to follow sat nav and road signs. And also they need to know their show me, tell me questions. Um, which are available uh, online and also via our website you can get onto the link to have a look at those so let's have a little chat about what's actually involved in the driving test and this is what you parents are asking us to tell you so the driving test um, first of all uh, your your child will have a, an eyesight test uh, and that's to be able to read a number plate at 20 meters now I'm sure that your instructor will have tested your 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 child's eyesight um, before they even take them out on the first lesson. Um, they will then get a, uh, a question, um, which is a show me, tell me question, and it'll be a, a, a tell me question. Um, and that'll be done in the car park at the test centre before they actually head off um, on their drive. The length of the test is about 38 to 40 minutes. And really weirdly, they actually managed to get in just about in that time frame every time, which is quite extraordinary when you think about all the traffic out there. Um, and then they'll get another question whilst they're on the move. And that will be a show me question. So that might be something such as show me how you'd clean the windscreen using the washers and wipers. Show me how you'd open your window fully and then close it. But again, you can see the link. You can see all, all of those questions easily enough. Whilst they're on their test, um, the student will get asked to drive independently for about 20 minutes. Um, and that's following the sat nav or following road signs and markings. And four out of five tests follow the sat nav rather than signs. So it's more likely to be sat nav than signs. Um, they will get asked to do one manoeuvre. Now, the manoeuvres that we have to learn or have to teach our students, there are four of them. Uh, it's a forward bay park, a reverse bay park, the dreaded parallel park 
and pull up on the right and reverse back two car lengths. So they need to be able to perform that maneuver. Um, and then one in three tests will have an emergency stop. Um, so that's basically what the test actually consists of. Um, and, you know, your instructor will have trained, you know, your, your child to meet the standards required on test. So let's have a look at the next section, which is what's the examiner actually looking for? What the examiner wants is a really good progressive drive, which is what we talked about at the beginning, isn't it? Of how you know when your child is ready for the test. They've got to be able to drive like you or I would. So they've got to be making good progress where it's safe. Um, and they've also got to be able to react to whatever whatever happens to them. Now, some pupils will go out and test and they'll have a nice, easy run round and nothing much will happen. But you get the next one going out and all sorts of things are going on. And they've got to be able to deal with that. They've got to be, be able to deal with anything that is thrown at them on the test. So the examiner wants to see that confidence and competence. They want to see good progress being made. They want to see good observations. They, it's really important that the student is aware of what's happening around them. And that's one of the biggest things. We'll talk about it in the next section. But um, very often pupils will fail their test because they're not actually aware of what's happening around them. So it's about keeping good observations going. Execution of manoeuvres have got to be good. And their response to other road users, as I say, and road signs and markings. So that's that section. So another big question is how is the test marked? Now, the driving test is marked in a series of negative points. You can't score a, a bonus point for getting something really good, which is a shame. Um, it's marked in negatives and you are allowed to have uh, 15 driver faults and still pass your test. Now, a driver fault we quite often refer to as a minor um, and 15 minors and you can still pass. But and here's the rub. If you get a serious or a dangerous mark, then that is an automatic fail. OK, so it's usually not the minors that are the problem. It's the serious or dangerous is. And we'll go on at the next section to actually talk about what would constitute a fail. But in general, a minor, a minor, a minor fault would be something such as um, perhaps forgetting to check their rear view mirror before signalling. Um, maybe they've just cut the corner slightly on a, a turn into a side road on the right, providing there's no cars waiting to come out. Um, maybe in their parallel part, they've just nudged the curb gently, or maybe they have um, pulled up on the left and they've left a little bit of a gap. So they're a little bit wide from the curb. Um, so those are the sort of things that are minors. Um, when we're talking about the serious and dangerous things, um, if at any time the examiner has to intervene in the control of the car, either verbally by telling Charlie to you have to slow down, stop, have you seen that pedestrian? That's a verbal intervention, and that would be classed as a serious error, which would constitute a fail. Um, or the other thing is if uh, they have to intervene physically, and that, that can sometimes go down as a dangerous. So if they've had to grab the steering wheel to avoid a collision, or they've even had to use the dual controls. Uh, so those would be serious or dangerous marks, which unfortunately would end up in a serious uh, or dangerous would be a fail. Uh, and one or more of those is a fail. So in my experience of nearly 18 years of teaching, I can honestly say I've never had a pupil fail their test for accumulating too many driver faults. If they fail, it's usually they've had a, a smattering of minors, but they've then done the one thing that's cost them the test and got a serious or dangerous for that. So, so that's how that works. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, in the next section. So don't forget, you can post questions at any time and we will come back to you with those. So um, let's have a look at um, how the um, test day goes for you. So if you are taking your child to test in your car, that's perfectly fine. You can do that. Obviously, as long as your um, car is tax and insured, of course, um, it must it display L plates front and rear. Um, and you must have an interior mirror for use of the examiner. So you can get those at any sort of car shop for a couple of quid. Um, you've got to make sure as well that you've got no lights out. So if there's any bulbs out on your car, then you won't be able to go out and test. So make sure you check that beforehand. Now, on the day, you need to turn up um, no more than five minutes before your test start time. And at the test centre that I operate in, in Salisbury, you're required to reverse into a, a parking bay in the test centre. Different test centres have different layouts. Some test centres don't even have car parks, so you just park up on the road. So you need to make sure that your child has with them their provisional license 
and their test theory um, pass certificate. Uh, so you turn up five minutes before, go into the test centre and take a seat in the waiting room and the examiner will come out um, and ask to see your licence and he'll check that. Uh, and the first thing they'll do is well, they would normally ask if your instructor would like to go on test with you. Now, because of COVID at the moment, as instructors, we're not allowed to accompany tests in the back. So it would just be the examiner and the student going out on test together. Um, one of the main things is that they'll go out and they will then be asked to read a number plate from 20 metres. And the examiners will sometimes pick a car out that's parked in the road. But more often than not, they'll read, get them to read a number plate um, off a five or six number plates that are screwed onto the wall 20 metres away. They'll jump in the car. The examiner will do a quick uh, check of the car, checking the tyre tread depth just uh, visually and checking that the car looks in good working order. Um, and then they'll, they'll get into the car and they will ask the student the first question, which would be the uh, tell me question. Uh, and then they'll get off on test. And they'll also ask the student if they would like a little bit of an explanation about the test. Um, before they go and it's a good idea to say yes because it sort of sounds a bit arrogant to say no and also it gives the student a little bit of time to calm down and relax and get used to sitting in car with the examiner so that's what happens on the day at the end of the test they will be given their results immediately um, and they will uh, get their test result sheets now emailed to them because uh, they're doing it now on uh, ipads so we're paperless now in the cars now, during COVID, um, the examiners will be wearing, I believe, a face mask and gloves. Um, it's up to you what you wear, but I would recommend that your child wears a mask and possibly gloves as well. So that's test day practicalities. Um, I think we've got a question coming in. Yes, a uh, question has just come in. What happens after a serious fault? OK, so good question. Uh, after a serious fault, um, normally the test would carry on. Um, providing the examiner has been able to um, keep the car and everybody safe, you'd carry on. Um, there is such a thing as a walk back, which is every instructor's dreaded, dreaded words. We hear the word walk back. And what that means is that somebody's gone out on test and they have done something so horrendous that the examiner has decided that they don't want to spend any longer in the car with them. And they'll get the, the driver to pull up in a safe place. And then they literally walk back to the test center. Now, the pupil has the opportunity to stay in the car and then wait for their instructor to come and get them. But normally the pupil will walk back with the instructor to the test centre. Now, funnily enough, when walkbacks happen, they usually happen quite quickly. So uh, they are not too far from the test centre. So that's uh, that's how that works. That's a walk back. And I have to say, honestly, I have never had a walk back. So uh, I'm not looking forward to my first one, but hopefully it won't ever happen. I think we've got another question coming in. Uh, can you give some examples of serious faults? Yeah, sure. So serious faults would be something such as I mentioned before, where the examiner has to intervene by perhaps grabbing the wheel. Um, and that, you know, that's where the examiner intervenes. But if it's a serious fault where the examiner hasn't intervened, it could be something such as the pupil has changed lanes without checking their mirrors. So if you were changing lanes from a left lane to a right lane, you'd need to check your rear view and right mirror and even a little not a blind spot check, but a, just a, a look to the side of the car. So that would be a serious fault. Getting in the wrong lane on approach to a roundabout and then switching at the last minute without correct observations, that would be a serious fault. Um, not stopping at a zebra crossing, for example, if someone was clearly waiting to cross. Not looking behind you before going backwards. And by looking behind you, we actually have to turn our head and look out of the back window. I think a lot of us, when we've been driving for a while, you'd start to tend to just think a quick glance in the rear view mirror would be enough. Well, it's not. You've actually got to turn your head and look out the back. Obviously, ramming the curb. Speeding. Now, speeding's an interesting one. Um, if you're, if the student on test creeps up in a 30 mile an hour, let's say, 30 mile an hour zone, and they creep up to, say, 32 miles an hour, and then immediately realise it and bring their speed back down, they might be okay and get away with that. It's not, it's not ideal. I wouldn't recommend it. But for sure, if they're doing 35 and a 30, they will fail their test for that. And the other thing that you might find surprising is you can actually fail your test for going too slowly. So an example of that might be um, if they were on the dual carriageway in a 70 mile an hour zone and they're traveling at 50 miles an hour um, and there's no good reason for it. So obviously, if it was throwing it down with rain or flooding or snow, 
well, I wouldn't take the test in snow, but you know, if there's a reason for going at 50 in the 70, that's fine. But if it's a good clear road, good clear dry conditions, they should be knocking on the door of 70. So you can fail for going too slowly. And that's that would be marks on the test sheet under hesitancy. So we've got another question coming in here. Yeah, what advice would you give parents to prepare for supervising a learner? Well, that actually is uh, what we're going to talk about more in more detail on our next webinar. Um, but the first thing you need to do is make sure that you have um, at least three years experience with a full as a full license holder, and you have to be over the age of 21, and you have to um, abide by all the normal rules. But um, basically, if you can make good use of your private practice, you can save money. And that's what we're going to aim to talk to you about at the next webinar. So good private practice, linking in with the instructors particularly, can save you money. And we use a very good system, My Drive Time, and we're using that to help you parents understand what your student needs to be working on. So what to work on, where to work on it, how to do it, and how to get the best out of the private practice. So at any time, please go onto our website, have a look at all the links. We've got loads of links into there, into all sorts of things that you'll find interesting. So please, please put some questions to us from this webinar. Um, and thank you for watching and um, hope to see you at the next one. Thank you very much.